we are moving on now to have a bit of story to share with you with Karen Given. Karen Given is a writer, a blogger, and a mass mouth storyteller. And she's also a reporter and producer for WBUR and NPR's Only a Game. Now living in Massachusetts, she was born and grew up in a tiny town in the Mojave Desert of Southern California um, called Joshua Tree. I need to check. Uh, and Karen stated that her town did not have stoplights, she did not have cable TV, and they did not have television until fourth grade. And Karen also stated because she didn't like dirt all that much, she spent a lot of her time reading indoors. But also noted uh, in growing up there was one special thing about her town, that they had a community theater there with 200 seats. And so she was involved in more than a dozen musicals by the time she was 18, although she stated she felt she couldn't hold a tune. She went on to study at BU and was interested in uh, reporting and announcing and said she had hoped to one day replace Tom Brokaw, but instead <laughs> she fell in love with public radio. And she's been working with public radio uh, most of her years, since 91. And she works, uh, as I mentioned, as a sports producer and reporter for radio. And uh, Karen stated that she's always been, uh, people assume that she's always been fascinated with sports. But she confesses, in truth, she came to the career accidentally almost 15 years ago. She was an experienced reporter in need of a job, and one was available in the sports show. Uh, but she goes on to say, I've come to really love what I do, and I'm quite the expert at obscure and unusual sports, but not the sporty chick that people expect her to be. In 2006, she had a visit to Africa and visited Kenya and Tanzania and wrote a story about a town in Kenya's Rift Valley and she won the National Moreau Award for that story. When I asked Karen what inspired her to start storytelling, she said that Bill Littlefield, the host of Only a Game, was asked to come and be the special guest at a Mass Mouth event. And she said, I told him that if he'd go, I'd go with him and tell a story. And from the first minute on stage, I was completely hooked. And so now we have the good fortune of hearing a sample of some of Karen's stories with us this morning. So please give a hand, a warm round of applause to Karen Given. So uh, when people ask me why I went to Africa, the answer kind of depends on who's doing the asking. Like if it's my mom, I say, mom, remember how much I love the San Diego Wild Animal Park, and I love seeing the zebra up on the hill, and I love trying to spot the lion in the grass, and it is absolutely true. I would not lie to my mother. I love the San Diego Wild Animal Park. Um, but if someone else were to ask me, like a close friend, someone I didn't mind being vulnerable with, I would say that I went to Africa because I had just gotten divorced. And after 12 years with the same guy and, and that sort of thing you do where one person takes care of one thing and the other person takes care of another thing, I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of calling my landlord. I was afraid of calling for pizza. <laughs> I was afraid of like waving at my neighbors. I was, I was terrified of everything. And I needed to do something big to make me not afraid anymore. But if someone else were to ask me, maybe uh, someone I just met or like a room full of complete strangers like you guys out there, I would probably say that I went to Africa to stick it to my ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a vengeful person at all. Like, I, I do not wish anyone ill will. I, I wish him the best. But it was just right for me to go to Africa. See, I don't know if any of you have ever lived with a clinically depressed person, but what can happen, and what happened to me, was that the idea that he was depressed because of some tweak in his brain chemistry was just 
too depressing. So he had to come up with reasons for his unhappiness, and his reasons for his unhappiness often had to do with me. So here's the best example. Uh, one day he decided that what would make him happy in this world is if we both quit our jobs, sold our house, bought a sailboat, and sailed around the world. And I think his idea was like to sail around the world just forever, indefinitely. And that was too much for me. So we entered that sort of negotiation thing that couples do that never works out well for anyone. And I said, okay, how about we sail around the world once? And he's like, no, no, once is not nearly enough. We have to sail around the world twice. Twice. And I was like, twice is way too long. So somehow we settled on sailing around the world one and a half times. <laughs> and we were going to end up in California, which is where my family was. And so this was an exciting idea. I figure this is good for everyone. And we start, we start thinking about all the fun and exciting things that this trip is going to bring. And one night in bed, we're talking about like how to avoid pirate infested waters on our sailing trip. And I see that really familiar cloud of depression cross over his face. And he says, oh, we can't do this. This isn't fair. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm excited about this trip. We're going to go around the world one and a half times. We're going to end up in California. It's going to be great. And he says, no, it's my dream. It's not your dream. And besides that, I'm a dreamer, and you're a person without dreams. And how can a dreamer stay with a person without dreams? So I thought about that for a second, and I said, you know what? I have a dream. I have always wanted to go to Africa, and I want to go while it's still wild, and I want to see the zebra roaming on the wide open plain, and I want to get up close and personal with the lions, and I want to see the snows of Mount Kilimanjaro before they all melt, because that's going to happen. And he thought about it for a second, and I have to say, this is the disease talking, he said to me, huh, well, that sounds like a stupid waste of money. <laughs> so when we got divorced, I took half of the money that he had been saving up to buy that sailboat, <laughs> and I took myself to Africa. I wish I could say that it all went really smoothly straight from the beginning, but it so did not. My first morning in a hotel in Nairobi, Kenya, I come down to breakfast and everything just seemed so weird and so foreign. I mean, the oranges were green. Like, if an orange is anything, an orange should be orange. But the oranges were green. And I thought, oh my god, I am terrified. What am I doing here? I can't walk across the street without having heart palpitations. And I am Africa by myself. What was I thinking? And I ran upstairs to my little tiny hotel room. And I climbed into my little tiny twin bed. And I pulled this like musty, dark blue bed shed, spread sheet over my head. And I stayed in there until like, literally, it was hours. Housekeeping was knocking down my door thinking that I was dead. And I finally came out. And I said, I just have to do this thing. And the one thing that I had to do on my first very, very scary day in Africa was I needed to buy a plane ticket to go from Nairobi to Eldoret, which is that place where I was going to do the story for uh, Only a Game. And it's not very far. If you look at it on a map, you, sh you think, oh, I should be able to drive there, but the roads in Kenya are terrible. So it could take you days to drive there, and it only takes about 45 minutes to fly. So I had gone online, I had found the airline, I had found the price, I had found the schedule, but it's Africa. I couldn't actually buy the ticket. So I figured the hotel will be able to help me. And I go down to the concierge, and there's this very nice young woman there. And she pulls out this uh, ratty yellow pages. Like, who's ever seen a yellow pages lately? And she's flipping through, flipping through. And she says, um, I don't see anything here. Um, but I'm sure it exists. I'm sure you're right. Uh, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to get in a cab and go to the airport, and they'll be able to help you there. And this 
ultimately terrified me because I had read in the guidebooks that there are two things that you have to worry about traveling alone in Africa, especially as a woman. The first is that uh, men are going to try to pick you up because just by virtue of having bought a plane ticket, you are rich beyond their wildest dreams. And like, who wouldn't want a sugar mama, right? So they're all going to try to pick you up. And then the second problem was that everybody said, cabbies are going to try to take you for a ride. So don't get in a cab if you can at all avoid it. So here I was faced with like the two biggest things at once because it was going to be a male cab driver taking me to the airport. But the concierge lady says, don't worry, I'll send you with our personal cab driver. His name is Victor. He'll take care of you. So I climb into Victor's car that looks nothing like a cab, <laughs> and uh, immediately he starts in with the questions. He's very nice, you know. Where are you from? I'm from Boston. Have you always lived in Boston? No, I grew up in California. Is this your first time in Kenya? Yes. Are you married? Yes. <laughs> But Victor's no fool, and he saw that I wasn't wearing a ring, and he saw the hesitation, and so he asked me to lunch, and I said no. And he asked me to dinner, and I said no. And then he kind of sighed, and he said, I wish I could find a nice woman like you to marry. <laughs> but he got me to the airport, and he was bringing me back, and the entire way he's getting these phone calls on his cell phone, because everyone in Kenya has cell phones. They don't have landlines. They don't have running water, but they have cell phones. And uh, he's getting these calls, and it's clear that the person on the other end of the line wants him to do something. And it's clear that Victor doesn't want to do this thing. But the entire conversation is happening in a language that I don't understand, so I don't really know what's going on. And he hangs up the phone after, like, the 15th phone call, and he says, Karen, I'd like to take you on a tour of my city. And I said, no, that's OK. I think we should just go back to the hotel. And he says, but Karen, it's a beautiful, beautiful city, and I would like to share it with you. And I said, well, Victor, we've already negotiated the price of this trip, and I think we should just go back to the hotel. And he gets this look, and he says, no, Karen, you misunderstand. This is a free tour. It's a free tour of my city. So what can you do? I say, OK, take me on the free tour. <laughs> so we go, um, we see like a supermarket um, and a Jehovah Witness church, which I found to be strange, but it looked just like any Jehovah Witness church anywhere else. Um, and then we pass this road, and he says, well, if you go down that way, you see all the embassies, and it's really beautiful. But he doesn't turn down that way. He turns the other way. And the areas that we're driving through get uh, poorer and poorer and sketchier and sketchier and scarier and scarier. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I am being kidnapped. Victor is kidnapping me. And the people at the hotel, they must be in on it because they know I'm alone and they sent me here with Victor. And oh my God, and I'm freaking out. And we pull into this um, dirt road. And on either side of the dirt road are these uh, stalls made from cardboard and tin. And Victor says, Karen, this is our slum. Lots of people do their shopping here because there's really good deals. And with that, a woman gets in the back of the car. And uh, Victor says, Karen, I'd like you to meet my wife. <laughs> So while I'm laughing about the hysterical nature of the meeting the wife of the man who's just been hitting on me for an hour, it turns out that the wife is the one who's been making the phone calls. And she had been doing her shopping in the slum. And she wanted Victor to come pick up the bags so that she didn't have to take them on the bus. And the two of them are a little chit-chatting in a language I don't understand. So I'm looking out the window at this slum. And it goes on for miles. It turns out I'm in a place called Kibera. And at its height, Kibera held 2.5 million people. It is enormous. And it is made of these little tiny shacks made of cardboard and tin and, you know, sewage running through the streets, which aren't really streets. They're just dirt paths. And it goes for miles and miles and miles. If you saw it from the sky, it would make you cry. But I'm looking out the window, and I see this little girl. And she's wearing a pink party dress with ruffles. And the dress is three sizes too big. And it looks like it's made out of some shiny material that's going to burst into flames if the sun comes out. But she's running along the side of this road without shoes. 
and she's laughing, and she's skipping, and she's giggling. And as the car drives away, and she tries to run and keep up with us, I realize people here can still be happy. And that's something I never would have known if I hadn't let Victor take me for a ride. And I say to myself, if I can just be brave and take this experience for all it'll give me, I will see things I never expected. So I see the things I expected. I went on a safari. I saw so many zebra that, like, after a while, we were all like, can we leave the zebra now and go see something fun, you know? <laughs> and I got up close personal with a lion. We, we pulled up right to a lion pride, and a mama lion was um, chewing on a buffalo head, which sounds really gross, but, you know, lions aren't vegetarians. Um, and I stuck my head out of the safari truck with Window, and I was this close to the mama lion. And I went to that town, Eldoret, in the Western Rift Valley of Kenya, and I did my radio story. And as part of my radio story, I needed to go, this, this town, I should say, I was a, a little town called Iten outside of Eldoret. And uh, it has about 300 people live there, and about 150 of them are long distance runners or training to be long distance runners. And so you wake up in the morning and the streets are clogged, but not with cars. Nobody there owns cars. The streets are clogged with runners. <laughs> then they're just running. And I was staying at this train center and I needed to get from the training center to the track where all the local runners did their speed work on Monday and Wednesday mornings I think and the people at the training center just said go down that path just walk down that path and you will get there so I set off down the path and of course it's a path it forks <laughs> so at the first fork in the path I, I went left and it kind of straightened out so I figured out I was doing okay and then it forked again and me, I was like, well, they told me to go straight. First I went left, so now I go right, and that makes straight, right? <laughs> so I went to the right, and I'm walking down that path for a little while, and I pass this house. It's a modest house, but it's, it's a house, and uh, it's in, out front, there's a gate. There's an iron gate that goes like this, which was strange because there was no fence. But, you know, apparently you don't need a fence to have a gate. And uh, there were no roads leading to this house. So you could only imagine that the people who lived there had to walk in and walk out with everything they had. But there were these two little kids playing outside the house, a little boy and a little girl. And they looked up and saw me. I must have been a sight, a white woman all by herself walking down this path in Africa. And the little girl's eyes get big, and she runs in the house shouting, Muzunga, 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 which means white woman, white woman, white woman. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my god, like these poor children, they've been terrified by this crazy white woman walking down the street. I feel so terrible. And I'm maybe 10 steps past the house. And I realize that the road is now going way off to the right. And there's no way I've taken the right path. And I need to turn around. But I thought, that's OK. They all ran inside. It's going to be OK. I turn around. And it turns out the little girl didn't run inside in fear. She ran inside to bring her whole family out to meet me. So now instead of two little kids, there are four little kids standing in front of this gate. And children in Kenya, um, they're not allowed to shake hands. You have to, you have to be an adult to shake hands. Children in Kenya bow their heads and you touch the top of their heads. So as I walk by, the children bow their heads and I touch the top of their heads. And it was just the most perfect, perfect moment. And then I went to Tanzania, which was a little less perfect. Um, on the way, uh, we twice had to bribe men with machine guns uh, to let us continue on our way, <laughs> which is not a happy moment. Um, and I got to this town called Arusha, which is at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro. And then I very quickly left Arusha and went to another mountain that was easier to climb. <laughs> And I climbed for three days. I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a mountain climber. I climbed for three days to watch the sunrise over the snows of Mount Kilimanjaro. And I went back to camp that morning. And I sat on a rock. And I stared at those snows. And I wasn't thinking about revenge. I wasn't thinking about my ex-husband. I wasn't thinking about 
12 years of my life misspent, maybe, what I was thinking about was, at that moment, I wasn't afraid of a thing. And that hadn't been true in a very long time. Thank you. Hen, sow, cat, nanny goat, doe, mare, cow, you, lioness, roe, vain, shallow, empty, pampered, weak, callow, fickle, scattered. She who rocks the cradle must be obeyed, over emotional, underpaid, wench, bitty, cute, sex kitten, small, virgin, naughty, vixen. <coughs> Selfless, self-sacrificing, Amazon, spiteful, unconditional, loves paragon, tart, fickle, flighty, vengeful, slut, matron, pea brain, blushful. Which, nagging, causing mankind's fall, inamorata, chain and ball, fox, goddess, chatty, starlet, girl, mistress, unprincipled, harlot, tigress, temptress, distaff side, patient, softer sex, ingenue, kind, nun, Venus, mother, spinster, flawed, body, haughty, frigid, broad, swan, seductress, invisible helpmate, doll, courtesan, knee weakener, cheap date, man-eater, childish, sneaky, dumb blonde, job stealer, rolling pill, pin wielder, fawn, battle axe, nymph, gossip, old maid. What time can I pick you up for our date? <laughs>
The seedlings are released from their peppercorn caplets like shedding helmets. And the ruffled edges of the first true leaves peek from under the lop-eared cotyledons drooping from the slender stems of the coriander seedlings. The harsh March winds have clouded them down where they lay in a thready tangle, but the warming sun beckons the chlorophyll to darken, the leaves to deepen into green, the stems to toughen and harden and push against the gravity and grow. Thank you very much. I recently wrote this poem, and I, I didn't have a title, but I, it just came to me. That the name of it is called Observations. Rain drops. Birds fly. Wind blows. People sigh. Sun shines. Moon rises. Days end. Life's disguises. Sweet. 